Hello, this is the devotional service for the third Sunday in End Time, which is Saints Triumphant. The theme for our worship this week is, Lord, keep us mindful of the judgment. Judgment Day is coming. God wants us to be ready for it. Well, it's not always easy. We have distractions all around us. We have things that make us fearful. We have things that make us happy. God wants us to always remember that he is coming and he wants us to be ready for it. We begin this morning. We pray. O Lord, teach us your ways that we may walk in your truth. You comfort and help us day by day. We trust in your loving care. You are the King of heaven and earth. We give you praise and thanks. Alleluia. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love him and to serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father, in heaven I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Let's pray the prayer of the day. Almighty God and Savior, you have set the final day and hour when we shall be delivered from this world of sin and death. Keep us ever watchful for the coming of your Son, that we may sit with him and all your holy ones at the marriage feast in heaven. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson for this Sunday is from Ezekiel chapter 37. We read verses 15 through 28. The word of the Lord came to me. Now you, son of man, take one piece of wood and write on it, belonging to Judah and belonging to the people of Israel associated with him. Then take another piece of wood and write on it, belonging to Joseph, Ephraim's piece of wood and the whole house of Israel associated with him. Then hold one piece of wood close to the other to make a single board for yourself so that they are one in your hand. When your countrymen say to you, won't you tell us what you mean by these things? You tell them, this is what the Lord God says. I am going to take the piece of wood which is in the hand of Ephraim, which is for Joseph and for the tribes of Israel associated with him, and I will attach it to the piece of wood for Judah. In this way I will make them one board, so that they will be one in my hand. The boards on which you will write should be in your hand in front of your eyes. Then say this to them. This is what the Lord God says. I am going to take the people of Israel from among the nations where they have gone, and I will gather them from all around, and I will bring them to their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one, ki one king will be king for all of them. Never again will they be two nations, and never again will they be divided into two kingdoms. Never again will they defile themselves with their filthy idols, with their disgusting practices, and with all their rebellious acts. I will save them from all their backsliding by which they have sinned, and I will cleanse them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. This is the word of our God. Our second lesson is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We read verses 13 through 18. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who have fallen asleep, so that you do not grieve in the same way as the others. Who have no hope. Indeed, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, then in the same way we also believe that God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. In fact, we tell you this by the word of the Lord. 
We who are alive and left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not go on ahead of those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of our God. Our gospel for this Sunday is from Matthew chapter 25. We read verses 1 through 13. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish ones took their lamps, they did not take any oil with them. But the wise took oil in in their containers with their lamps. While the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. But at midnight there was a shout. Look, the bridegroom! Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, No, there may not be enough for us and for you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. While they were away buying oil, the bridegroom came. Those who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other versions also came and said, Lord, Lord, let us in. But he answered, Amen, I tell you, I do not know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. This is the gospel of our Lord. Our devotion this morning, or today, is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're focusing on verses 13 to 18, that, that second lesson that we heard this morning, or heard today. One of the, the bittersweet privileges that I have as a pastor is to be able to share the last moments of, of people's lives on earth. And when when death is right in front of you, suddenly all those lessons about about heaven, about sin and grace, about what comes next, all of a sudden, they become really important. You realize, I'm going to be in heaven in a short time, and I don't really know much about it. For most people on any given day, it's, it's always an event way off in the future, and we really never give it much thought. But, but for a Christian, on their deathbed, very soon they'll be stepping into heaven, and it will be their home forever. And, and all those amazing truths that just don't seem to apply to us on any other day, you know, the ones that we don't pay much attention to, those, those truths are real, and they're important. We leave our worship services or our our Bible studies or funerals and we get on with our busy lives without giving it much thought every day. But one day, we will be within hours of stepping into heaven. And maybe that day is today. We don't know. Do you know what to expect? The Apostle Paul summed it up for the Christians in Thessalonica. He said, we will be with the Lord forever. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep, Paul wrote. If there's one thing that God wants for us, it's that we know everything that he's telling us in his word. And the sad truth is sometimes we're so satisfied to know as little as necessary. I'll never forget the answer I read on a Bible study survey once. The question was, if you're not attending Bible class, explain why. And one of the answers was, I learned all those things in confirmation class when I was younger. Even if somebody has a a photographic memory, the catechism classes that we we teach to 5th through 8th graders, they're the very bare bones basics of the knowledge of God's word. The attitude of, I know enough, that's not how Jesus sees it. He commanded us to, Make disciples of all nations by baptizing and by teaching them to observe everything 
that I have commanded you. Everything. When the Apostle Paul left the congregation in, in the city of Ephesus, he said to those Ephesians, I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. The Christians in Thessalonica were troubled by a vital truth that they just didn't know. They understood that Christians would be alive when Jesus returned on the last day, but what would happen if a Christian dies before Jesus comes back? Will he or she miss out on heaven? That's an important thing to know. And you and I may be surprised to know that they didn't know the answer. We learned that truth in Sunday school. But could you explain it to a co-worker or to a fellow church member or your own children for sure what happens when a person dies? Do you know for sure what to expect when Jesus returns? How do you know that you have it right? Do you know where to go in the Bible to answer these questions for yourselves or to explain it to somebody else? Paul wrote in this section of 1 Thessalonians, we do not want you to be ignorant. That's God's will for the truths of his word. He wants us to know for sure. So Paul took his Christian readers, uh, his Christian friends, back to what they did know. Started out with the basic truth. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. Those are the facts. The facts that are never going to change. Written in the very blood of God himself. See, Jesus' death proved that payment was made for the sins of the whole world. And God sacrificed his own son to redeem us, to buy us back from sin, from death, from the devil. Jesus' resurrection, his breaking free from that grasp of death, proved that the payment he made for sin was accepted. And his resurrection also proved that he can and most certainly will raise all the dead. But those who did not believe in Jesus when they died will rise from the grave, but only to be condemned. But those who did believe in Jesus when they died, he said they'll rise to live in heaven. That's why Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. This wonderful, wonderful truth added a whole new window of understanding for these Thessalonians who were, who were wondering about their family and friends who died as believers in Jesus. Paul assured them, God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. In fact, there won't even be any advantage for those who happen to be alive when Jesus returns. At his command, at Jesus' command, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then the believers who are still alive when Jesus comes back will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. In one of our hymns, we sing, What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Well, there's other things that make us so we forfeit our peace and have pain that we don't need. And we could change that last line to, all because we do not study all that God has told us there. Ask yourself, do you have a daily reading plan for God's word? Are you preparing to be with the Lord forever? Do you know what that last day is going to be like? Do you know for certain? There's a, there's a huge difference between funerals for, for occasional Christians and funerals for faithful Christians. The, the talk, the music, and especially the behavior and the facial expressions. For one group, there's tears, uncontrollable tears and, and moaning. There's a general sense of sadness and hopelessness. It's as if their loved one is lost forever and would never be seen again. God even describes those types of funerals. Writing to the Ephesians, he says they were without God and without hope in the world. But there's another kind of funeral. At those funerals, there are tears, naturally. There's sadness, again, naturally. But there's also smiles. There's a different attitude, a different air at the funeral. The atmosphere is markedly different. At a funeral for someone who has died in the Lord, like Paul says, we do not grieve as the rest of men who have no hope. Now, Paul doesn't say Christians don't grieve. Death brings heart-rending grief and tears. Jesus grieved and wept when his own friend, Lazarus, died. But Christians, 
we have something different that, that unbelievers of the world don't have. Christians have hope. Like Paul says to the Thessalonians in our section today, we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. See, it's one thing to know the truth, and it's another thing to trust it. The devil knows that Jesus died and rose again. The devil knows that Jesus will come back again on that last day. The devil even knows that Jesus will raise the dead and take all believers to be with him in heaven. These are all things he knows. But the devil does not trust in God or trust in what he says. The person who knows the truths of God's word but does not trust what God says is no better off than the devil. What comfort is there in knowing that Jesus died on the cross but not trusting that his death did something for you? That his death paid for your sins? What joy is there in knowing that, that I've been baptized, but not trusting that in baptism Jesus assures me that I belong to God, that I have God's forgiveness, that my sins are washed away? What peace is there in knowing that Jesus lives to rule all things, but not trusting that he rules for you, for your benefit, to provide for everything that you need? When we're standing at the graveside of a loved one who died in faith, how can we deal with our grief if we know that Jesus rose from the dead, but we don't trust that he's taken his child to be with him forever. As each and every one of us looks down the road to wherever that death is that, that God has set for us, when we face our own death, how are our tears going to be stilled if we know the truth that Jesus destroyed death, but we don't trust that he did it for me? Friends, if God says it, he means it. When God says that Jesus' death was to take your sins away, that Jesus' death was for you, for you personally. He means it. If he said it, he wants us to take him, to take him at his word. And his word, it gives hope. His word creates that faith to trust these things. Even when you look around and you see things that just don't seem to line up with reality, the word of God is the truth. The Lord is going to do what he said. When you hear your Heavenly Father speaking to you, trust him. This must have been a great comfort to, to the Thessalonians when, when they heard, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. When Jesus returns, can you, can you picture it? There's going to be a great reunion of believers in heaven. You'll get to walk up to Father Abraham and shake his hand. Beloved Christian friends and family members will meet together in the presence of their Savior to sing that new song in heaven. Until then, God lets us in on the secrets of his heart to tell us how much he loves us and to share the treasures of his, his amazing grace. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in, in chapter 2 of his first letter, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has planned for those who love him. But he has revealed it to us by his Spirit. As we learn what God says, as we keep on studying and growing up in our salvation, we have a lot to talk about. But so often we end up talking about the weather or our favorite teams, our, our jobs, our hobbies, the economy, the election, things that annoy us, and just about anything that has to do with everyday life. And that's okay. But there's a lot more to talk about, isn't there? Paul tells us in these, these words of the Thessalonians, encourage one another with these words. Paul says, this, this is his way of saying, share what God has revealed to you. Share the hope that you have. What do we say to a fellow believer who is hurting over the death of their loved one? I, I pray it's more than just, I'm sorry. Because, friends, we have so much hope to share with others. Share that, that comfort that Jesus gives with, with the loved one, that, that he conquered the grave for him or her. He promised that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. When somebody is wrestling with, with guilt, things that happened in their past that they know is wrong, tell them more than just to forget about it and get on with life. Give them God's power to dissolve that guilt, the truth of the blood of Christ that makes that guilt gone. Unburdened consciences. Assure that the full forgiveness of sins that Jesus earned is for that person. It's for all people. 
when somebody is having problems, offer to help and give more. Pray, pray, pray for them. Remind them that Jesus is praying for them too, at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Friends, no matter what is going on in your life today, one truth is never going to change. Believers in Christ, we're on the way to be with the Lord forever. And on that day, nothing else is going to matter. So really nothing else matters today, does it? Let's not grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Because Christ is coming soon and Christ is coming for you and for me. Encourage one another with these words. Amen. And now the, the peace of Christ, which transcends all understanding, let it guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all people throughout the world to strengthen believers and to enlighten believers, we pray, Lord, have mercy. For peace and justice among nations, for honest leaders and good neighbors, for the gift of love, for steadfast faith and patient endurance, we pray, Lord, have mercy. For those who suffer pain or sorrow, for the lonely and depressed, for the poor and needy, for those who love us and those who hate us, we pray, Lord, have mercy. Be gracious to us, defend us with your power, and bring us to glory everlasting. To you, O Lord, we entrust ourselves. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and preserve us. Amen. <laughs>